On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Windows has lost the ability to know itself. We've got a lot of hate for Equifax. And Jay Patello from Savius is here to explain why NetFlow is not enough. Twyet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 256, recorded September 8th, 2017. Savius, the network knows. Welcome to Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise, but I can't guide you by myself. It's an awfully big and sometimes scary world. For that, I'm going to need a little help from my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi. He is the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii, and he is currently melting into a puddle of Hawaiian guy. Uh, Chibert, <laughs> how you doing? Uh, yeah, it's still hot, and my air conditioner, yes, is still broken, but uh, that's what they make. Peltier circuits for, you know, semiconductor heat pumps. So I think I'm going to have a little heat pump. I'm going to mount <laughs> it on the desk and I'm going to have it blow cold air at me. You know, that's something that I discovered when I was still living in Hawaii that you don't necessarily have to cool the entire room. There's just certain parts of your body that can be strategically cooled to make you feel cool. Yeah. Does that actually work? You. Ew, okay, good. <laughs> Someone who is not you and is coming to you from an actual air-conditioned office is Mr. Lou Maresca. He is, uh, well, he's a senior bigwig. He's kind of a big deal over at Microsoft. Lou, how are you? It's good to have you back, my friend. Yeah, doing great. Uh, just getting really busy. Like I said, uh, like a couple weeks, we're spending time working for Ignite here, so uh, a couple weeks from now. Yeah, and that's going to be, that's in Orlando, correct? Yeah, it's in Orlando, so hopefully uh, Orlando still will still be there. Yeah, when it'll we be get okay. There. <laughs> it'll be okay. I think it'll be okay. You've got time. You've got time. They can clean up and get get you all ready. Well, gentlemen, this is going to be one heck of a show. Not only do we have to talk about, of course, a, a massive breach across the United States, but we're going to be bringing in a guest who's going to help those whose help screens and diagnostic tools are overwhelming them with just too much information. But before we get there, as is our custom, we got to kick it off with the blips. Now, Microsoft has made huge, huge strides in the last three decades in securing the Windows operating system. From a somewhat hardened kernel to more timely updates to working more closely with third parties to ensure application integrity, Microsoft has made an OS that definitely isn't bulletproof, but is at least able to tell you when it's been owned, which is why a newly discovered bug, which has existed in all Windows versions since 2000, is disturbing, as it allows an attacker to camouflage malware making it look like an authentic, legit, legitimate, and authorized OS operation. The attack focuses on the Windows pre-installation environment and the PS set load image notify routine. The PS routine is designed to identify changes to the kernel as drivers, processes, or runtime PE images are loaded into virtual memory. The problem is that the full image name parameter, which identifies the PE being loaded, was poorly written. It does not provide the full path to dynamically loaded user mode PEs. An attacker can use this shortcoming to malform the path, exceeding the maximum length, overriding the shared buffer, and giving the PS set load image routine an outdated value. In other words, an attacker can load malware into memory, and the kernel will think it's a legitimate process. What's worse, since antivirus and anti-malware solutions use the PS set load image routine, a successful attack is undetectable. Hey, man. Nike can now make you a custom set of kicks in about 90 minutes. Woohoo! While the article says less than an hour, the reality is, is that choosing your options are going to take nearly as long as getting them made. So while the New York Nike Makers experience is saying nearly every aspect of the shoe can be customized, the final list of options hasn't been revealed yet. What this looks like is the beginning of a trend alluded to in science fiction, where customers can step into a full body scanner and get a custom set of clothes made. Woohoo! Kim.com is fighting the fight for another product he tends to release soon, but for now, he's feeding the public with a private invite for betas. 
BitCash is a document store that you can upload your documents, code, videos, music files, and get paid in Bitcoin for people to access them. Once uploaded, the files can be shared and posted on most social network sites as well as via email. Once you upload the, upload the file, you get the option to fully customize the landing page for people to see when what they look at, what they're actually looking at when they try to acquire your content, as well as you get to connect your Bitcoin wallet to the account, and away you go. Storage sites that you can connect to is quite extensive, including Google Docs, Dropbox, Reddit, and even WikiLeaks, as well as ways to upload swarms to swarm sites, as well such as File, Coin, and Sia. What makes it so compelling is the ability to easily upload and spray your content across the web with one click of a button. Since it's pay for your download system, one wonders that what type of system or service that will be in the future as it starts some trends. Okay, so my last blip was a little crazy software brain hurt geeky. So let's do a little off script and talk about a real piece of enterprise hardware. A huge honking ship. That's right, Maersk, the Danish cargo ship behemoth, and passenger ship company Viking Line are ready to test cylindrical sails on their vessels that have the ability to drop fuel consumption by a jaw-dropping 10%. The sails are 10-story vertically rotating carbon composite cylinders that use the Magnus effect to generate thrust. Essentially, electric motors spin the cylinders, and as airflow passes the sail, some of it is dragged by the spinning surface, deflecting the wake that would usually be produced directly behind the cylinder in the path of the airflow. This offset wake pushes the sail at an angle to the wake and gives the ship a shove. How much of a shove? Well, the 10-story sail can generate as much thrust as a 3-megawatt main engine, while drawing less than 90 kilowatts of electricity. The system is fully automatic, networked to the bridge control, so that thrust angles and rotational speed are calculated and implemented to complement the thrust and directional controls on the bridge without need for human intervention. With more than 90% of worldwide goods shipped over the oceans, this experiment could have vast implications for energy use in the supply chain. Expect the long-term tests to start in 2018. While well, Europe is ruling that employers must inform employees of email snooping, a landmark privacy judgment by the European Court of Human Rights, aka ECHR, could impact the scope of email monitoring in the workplace. The Strasbourg-based court ruled on Tuesday employers must inform staff if, if they are spying on their work emails and communications. The final decision in the long-running case of a Romanian man against his dismissal over his use of a work messaging account saw the judges rule in favor of Bogdan, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that last name. Um, the engineer was fired by his employer 10 years ago after being presented with printouts of his private chats with his family. The judges found the company had infringed on Barbescu's right to privacy by not informing him ahead of accessing his communications. Some of the messages were described as being of an intimate nature. European nations such as France have already taken steps to give citizens more rights concerning their business communications. Earlier this year, the country enacted a law requiring companies to negotiate times when staff can ignore email and other correspondence. My question is, will the U.S. follow the ECHR for similar suggestions as U.S. courts rule on employee privacy? Quantum devices are continually part of the sci-fi paradigm of technology. Well, until now, the U.S. and Italy have built a quantum memory device. Now, if you know, a quantum memory device is actually capable of storing and releasing quantum states on the level of individual qubits on demand. Such a device needs to be entirely coherent in order to achieve unidirectional transfer. Well, what does this mean in the tech? Well, this particular tech was developed by researchers and can fit on a small chip, making it a thousand times smaller than similar devices. The chip is around 10 by 0.7 micrometers and has is, has a long and thin it's long and thin and is notched and triangular shaped with mirrors on either end the notch is actually create cavities and hold uh, that hold a crystal cavity that traps single photons encoding data of information zero one or both to show that the device was actually storing data information the team compared the wave function of the photons both before and after the storage and found them to be virtually unchanged meaning they still held their zero one or both state and it had been destroyed what does this mean? Well, it means they truly have a quantum memory device. Just imagine your PC in the next five years having quantum speed and memory. Just a little note, that man's name was Bogdan Barbulescu, but in the, in the United States, that's pronounced 
Smith. Now, how much does Google want a piece of the enterprise pie? Well, they are so hungry to pull customers away from Amazon AWS and Microsoft Azure that they're sending out free Chromebooks to demo the flexibility of their approach to cloud infrastructure. Google's latest salvo into the enterprise world is dedicated interconnect. It's a service that allows the enterprise to build infrastructure in Google's data centers that are treated as if they belong to the enterprise address space. This service is ideal for companies that run high security, high bandwidth applications like financial systems, content distribution, video editing, and large relational databases. Companies interested in using dedicated interconnect can lease up to 8, 10 gigabit per second connections for $1,700 each per month, with an additional monthly fee of $72 per VLAN attachment per month. The connections can be bonded for up to 80 gigabits per second, used for redundancy or a configuration in between. Google is not yet offering an SLA, but they claim that a client using two connections will experience 99.9% .9 uptime. That does it for the blips. Let's go ahead and move into the bytes. And yes, the first one really couldn't be anything other than this. We are accustomed to breaches. We've seen a lot of them from Sony to Yahoo to AOL. It's become a way of life in the enterprise where we know that the data is eventually going to make its way out. But there's something about this latest breach that test has us, well, stroked the wrong way. It's a hack, a smack, and some hacks. Now, the Equifax breach and insider trading scandal is still in progress. It's still growing. Yesterday, Equifax announced that their security had been breached and that potentially half of the adult population of the United States had personally identifying information exposed. They've been vague on details of the breach because of the ongoing investigation, but here's what we can gather. First, Atlanta-based Equifax is one of the big three suppliers of credit information in the U.S. In fact, it's one of the largest in the world. It employs almost 10,000 people and gathers and stores information on more than 800 million consumers and almost 90 million businesses worldwide. The breach that we're speaking of was discovered on July 29, 2017. Equifax says that the attackers, quote, exploited a U.S. website application vulnerability to gain access to certain files, unquote. We know that the attackers had access to the names, birth dates, social security numbers, addresses, driver's license numbers, and other data for 143 million people. Now, that other information includes things like credit card numbers, of which 209,000 U.S. consumers were affected, as well as personally identifying information on dispute documents of credit charges for about 182,000 consumers. Also, hidden in the release is the fact that Equifax has also admitted that information on Canadian and UK citizens may have also been accessed. Okay, so this is the playing field. This is what we know. These are the facts that we can confirm. Now let's go ahead and break it down into a little bit of analysis. Cheeber, this is the biggest breach we've experienced, not in terms of the number of users. The uh, Yahoo breach is still much bigger than that with, with more than a billion but this is the biggest in the terms of the amount of sensitive data that was released. We're not talking about just a username, just a password, just a little bit of personally identifying information. This is all the big ticket items. Social security, name, date of birth, address, credit history, dispute history. I mean, it's much easier to create a false persona with the information that leaked out of Equifax than ever leaked out of any other hack, be it Home Depot or, or Sony. So... Let's talk a little bit about what this means. What exactly is it about the story that makes it so grand? What is it that has shocked the world, not just of the tech people, not just of the IT people, but everyone who even remotely might have their information with Equifax? I say to everybody in the United States and Canada and so forth, join the club. Um, you now feel like I felt when OPM lost all my personally identified info information off my security clearance paperwork. Um, I predict that if you are going to buy a stock, buy something like uh, LifeLock or something like that, because this is ridiculous. Um, I personally think that maybe, just maybe, we might want to start seriously thinking about revamping how we do credit checks. Because we have three corporations that have so much personally identifiable information on the population that 
it almost makes it so the credit application process is can't happen anymore. You know, you can't trust it. So I really wonder. Uh, Equifax, come on, really? Um, sorry, man. Back to you. Let, let's talk about that. Actually, the cheaper. That's it's very good that you bring that up. That maybe it's time to to look at how we do credit checks. We've been comfortable with the system, in which, at least in the United States, we have the three big credit bureaus. And anytime we go to apply for credit, be it a loan, maybe we're looking to get a new car or even just a new credit card, they check with those three agencies to see what our credit history looks like. Now, we've been okay with that because we assume that all that information must be locked away. In fact, a lot of us don't even know exactly how much information those companies are gathering on us legally and keeping it legally. Lou, I want to throw this over to you. Is there a better way? Is there a better way to do credit checks? Or do you have to have a centralized repository of credit information in order to make a sound financial decision on whether or not a new client is a good risk? I don't think you, you, have, you don't have to have a central web repository of any piece of data. Um, you know, as long as you can somehow piece the data together in the end, I don't think it needs to be a central spot. It doesn't need to be secured the same way, especially if it's, you know, data that might not be identifiable. You can, you can separate these things apart. You know, my potential or, you know, potentially fake issues that I've have with my, uh, you know, my credit, let's say I have a bunch of issues. They don't have to be part of my identifiable information anywhere. Um, that could be retrieved from some unknown, you know, data storage location that's been encrypted and highly regulated. And uh, even if they get that, they will never be able to kind of turn it back on me. Um, and so I don't know why this was, you know, why this was a big problem for them. It, it seems like they, you know, I don't want to open any boxes here, but I think, you know, they should have been regulated on the data they were collecting and the data now that's now leaked, they should be held accountable for. They shouldn't have waited as long as they did. Um, you know, and this also shows the problems with now the fact that the social security number um, is, is another discussion that we should have in the future about like ridding ourselves of this one thing that identifies us all. Um, you know, there's there's lots of things here that we should probably be talking about. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because we've also got Woody in the chat room who is echoing one of your sentiments. And that's the fact that it took them six weeks to announce this. Now, Chebert, you and I are very clear in our stance on this. We believe in 100% transparent failure. Uh, and not only that, we believe that there should be a rule about 100% transparent failure. We should reward companies that immediately get the word out, that try to protect their consumers. We should give them the benefit of the doubt if they do and give them legal protections if they come forward. This is the exact opposite case. This is this is old corporate America saying we're going to sit on it until we figure out how to do damage control and maybe people will not be so concerned about it a month or two months from now. They no, dude, found they, they this hack. In, on July 29th, they say they moved to immediately stop it and investigate it. But the fact that we haven't heard about it for a month and a half, all the while this information is public, how is that not criminal? Well, if we want to talk criminal, after the breach, but before the announcement, three of their executives show, sold a whole bunch of their stock. Is that insider trading or what? You know, we were talking about it before the show started. And, you know, we're as journalists, if you have like for me, I've got non-disclosures on a couple of different corporations. I've actually been advised that I should not be trading in certain, you know, most tech companies. And the SEC says, you know, this, you know, it's not illegal, but please don't because we have to go and take a look at you on insider trading. But why weren't the what's happening to these execs? This is the definition of insider trading. They're saying it was a scheduled sale. This just sounds like old corporate America being really evil. You know, I see Dr. Evil twiddling his whatever, you know. <laughs> I, I'm just really PO'd about these people because and credit uh, credit check company if they go and make a mistake and they go and trash your credit his, your your credit score that hurts you bad I, people have not gotten house loans not gotten car loans all kinds of different things they are just arrogant and yeah. they need to be held a lot more accountable 
Okay, and let's let's talk about. I do want to talk about the insider trading. I do want to talk about the response because the Equifax response, I think, could probably best if we were going to be if we were going to be kind and compassionate about the terms and and technical about the terms in which the response was done, could be called a dumpster fire. It was definitely a dumpster fire. But but Lou, let's talk about right now um, just <laughs> a, a little bit about this breach uh, a, a bit more. Let's let's expand this when you're looking at the way that Equifax has slowly rolled out information about the breach, that it was probably because of a, either a misconfiguration or some breach of a US-based front web-facing server that allowed access into the back end. Um, and then the fact that they sat on this information while it was actively out there. For us, it seems a no-brainer that this should be criminal activity. What keeps it from being criminal activity? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm no, I'm no lawyer or anything, but what I, what I do say is like, how the hell did they get access to a web server and then get access using that server, get access to all the other data? Like, I don't, I don't even understand that sentence well, like in the day of cloud services today. Uh, but if let's say they did, um, and so now they you know, use some, you know, JIT admin privileges to get to some of these other s services that now contain data with PII and they've extracted it. Um, and you know, to me, you know, going back to the fact that there should be some law around how fast they are required to respond to something like that, just like how fast a company is responsible for for, you know, when there's a problem with the car and they have recalls or, or same thing problem when, you know, when, you know, you, what, how, you know, when you're supposed to be you know, supplied information about something going wrong with. Um, a transaction that you do. So, I mean, there's there's lots of things that go that should be surrounding this. I think I think they should be held accountable. I think there there should be a class action suit that's sent against them to send a message that you know this shouldn't have been tolerable. You should have secured your data and you should have set up your technology different in this day and age. And this particular information is so valuable that there's going to be there's going to be a cascading effect from years to come. I think after this. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that accountability because, uh, and we have to move into the actual response. As we've seen in past breaches, there is an offer of free credit monitoring. This happened with the OPM breach. This happened with Yahoo. This happened with Home Depot. This happened with Target. The whole idea is, okay, we've done wrong. We're going to give you this year of credit monitoring. And hopefully after a year, your information is not really that vulnerable anymore. However, what, we, what we have, we've had in the developing story is that Equifax, when they first put out their response, A, their website was a disaster. And I'm not even going to give you the link for it because it is a horrible, horrible place. You had to put in the last six of your social and your name, and then they would tell you whether or not you were part of the exposed information. It would then go directly to a free offer of credit monitoring, which sounds wonderful, except if you read the EULA. In the really teeny tiny fine print, it says if you accept this, then you say that you will not sue us, that you have to submit to arbitration. Tiny little, little print at the bottom. Now, the, the wonderful thing about this is in order to get away from criticism that they were taking away rights from people that they had victimized, they also mentioned that you can opt out of this arbitration if you mail us. Not email, not go to a website, not click something, but mail us through the U.S. Postal Service within 30 days. Chebert, um, I, I mean... It's, it's almost comical. I don't think I could have designed a worse response to the breach than what Equifax is doing right now. I mean, it's still, it's, it's still happening. In fact, right now we've got people in the chat room who are saying they're rethinking that policy, no duh. But how tone deaf do you have to be in this day and age to have not learned anything about past breaches and to just imagine that your users are all idiots? Um, yeah, this... I have seen this so, so many times. You know, I'm sorry. When the C-suite, you know, apologies to anyone, you know, when the C-suite is getting up in the years and they do not have the education in the technology, all they hear when, a, when someone in security goes, we need to go and, you know, do this or do that, all they hear is, wah, 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 you know, Charlie Brown's teacher. The hassle is we have way too much power with people in the C-suite that do not understand the technology or do not understand the ramifications. You know, this is starting to get to the point where maybe, just maybe, our American business colleges need to go and change what they're teaching because these policies on 
oh, they've been in they've been in the job for 30 plus years. They know better than it. No, I'm sorry. The world is changing way too fast. I personally would love to see this is me being an optimist. I would love to see us having to, you know, citizens instead of Social Security Administration giving us a Social Security number. I would love to see us being issued dual key encryption, a public key and a private key. The credit bureaus only get the public key and you cannot ever touch that information unless the user goes and says, Mr. Bank, I'm applying for a loan. Here is a one-time use token. So instead of using two-factor, it may be three-factor of some sort. I plug in my key, I type in my PIN, it releases a one-time use key to get access to my records. Ain't going to happen. It's going to cost way too much money. But American finance must change because this is broken. Yeah, let's talk about the brokenness. Lou, you brought up in your early comment that uh, the SSN is outdated. And I think I think we've all kind of agreed on that, but it's been one of these things where there's no way we're going to change it. There's th This was like when we had that discussion two years ago about how retailers are never going to change their point of sale PCI practices until it hurts them enough. And it finally did. It finally became so hurtful on the bottom line that they decided to upgrade. Now, the upgrade was questionable, but at least they upgraded. Are we at that point where something finally has to be done with social security numbers? There's, it's, it's, a, it's ridiculous in the, in the day and age of the information era where it is so easy to find people's personally identifying information, to have a number that forever identifies someone and can never be changed from birth to death. That's not doable, right? I mean, there is no system you can design to keep that secure. No, I think I think that's right. I mean, once the numbers exposed, it's like having a password, the master password for everything. I think that um, you know, once that thing is exposed, if you don't have two ways or three ways or four ways to secure that thing, once they have that master thing, you're done. But what you know, what to kind of bring it back is, you know, like like Chibert was saying, is you know, having a way to have access to information short term, whether it's a short term access token or something. That's the way the front end should have been developed, by the way. Anyways, they, the user tries to access their data, they have a short term long short term access token that goes and gets the data from some store and then it expires and goes away and then it, even if they expose for the front end they don't have access to the data so i mean but that's the same way any type of identifiable information should be stored it shouldn't be stored as one single number i call a bank they ask me for my last four of my social security number why why do they need that information why do they ever need my social security number again like it doesn't make sense to be to identify a person by a single piece of information um, if they can supply something that's a, that's unique to them that that's ever changing. So I think that, um, you know, I think going forward, this is definitely something that we need to do. I think there are other countries already kind of moving into this space. Uh, we need to file suit. We need to follow suit. And, you know, as soon as it starts affecting you know, the the country's credit itself. Um, people are going to start stop investing in technology and other things in the United States. Um, it, it probably is not going to push it to change. We've got Emily the Strange in the chat room. She's making a comment. I think most of us uh, are holding close to our hearts, and that is, if you guys thought getting the U.S. to switch to chip and sign was a long, long fight, just wait till you see what it takes to get a replacement for a Social Security number. And unfortunately, I I agree with you, Emily. In a second, uh, gentlemen, I, I, I want to throw you the question that is behind all of these breaches, which is who actually owns the data? I mean, that's what we're talking about. No matter what kind of breach, ultimately it becomes all of this information is being gathered that can personally identify us, that can affect our lives. And the question of ownership is still very much fuzzy. But before we get there, let's go ahead and, and talk about some of the vagaries, vagaries of this uh, of this story. Uh, the first one has to be the insider trading. Now, Chibert, you alluded to this. We know that after the breach, so after July 29th, but before the announcement of the breach, in fact, it was this all happened on August 2nd, three executives of Equifax sold large numbers of shares in the company. Uh, now, we know that it was CFO John Gamble. He sold $946,374, or 13% of his stake. The president of U.S. Information Solutions, Joseph Logren, sold $584,099, or 9% of his uh, stake. And president of Workforce Solutions, Rodolfo Plotter, sold $250,458, or 4% of his stake. 
Now, this happened just a few days after the breach, before the announcement. Equifax has come out and said these executives knew nothing about this. They, they didn't know about the breach. They didn't know about the investigation. But other people are looking at this and, and saying this is more than coincidence. They all sold on the same day, and they all sold off the scheduled sale of uh, of their uh, of their shares. In other words, they normally file a form that, that that's an intent to 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 shell, sell their shares, and that's specifically to stop insider trading. It looks suspicious. Equifax is saying no, no, no. They they didn't know. They didn't do anything wrong. But it asks it begs the question that when you have a breach like this, and when you know that a breach in this day is always going to affect the value of the company, does there have to be some sort of internal policy of you're in lockdown mode. You cannot free, you cannot sell. Everything is frozen because more than anything else, we have to regenerate public trust in our company. Chiber, let's start with you. I mean, is this is this legislation uh, type, type action where you say, if your company has an ongoing investigation, you tell all your executives your shares are, are frozen? Actually, I think this is a corporation not following the rules because I'm sorry, the three all selling on the same day all after the after the notice of no i call bs i totally call bs and i call for the u.s attorney general's office and the sec to go and slap the iron on these guys and put them in jail because this is insider trading this is a breach of the public trust um congress if there isn't a law make one yeah yeah and, and again see Technically, Equifax is right uh, because it, it's going to be so difficult to prove that they had information. We can all say they should have known. They were executives. They were high-level executives. They should have known something major was happening at their company. And it does seem suspicious that they all sold on the same day just a couple of days after the breach. But at the same time, if you don't have any sort of legislation that, that says this is how a responsible company must act in the face of a breach – then they did nothing wrong. I mean, Lou, I mean, am I am I missing something here? But according to the the current rules, unless we can have that smoking gun, that email to the executives that tells them exactly what happens, they're in the clear. Yeah, I think interpretation of law, that, that's what we're saying. But I think, you know, like Cheaper said, if it, it, this doesn't seem like a coincidence. Um, you know, it would be different to like if there was a breach in Amazon and Jeff Bezos sold some stock and all oh, look at Jeff Bezos, you know, sold some stock because, but if then all of his executives sold stock too. I mean, we would look at the same thing as it doesn't matter what the corporation and say, this is all insider trading. Um, and we look in the past, like the Martha Stewart scenarios and others, these all are very similar. They're, they, they match kind of the same thing. And, um, you know, even if there's even a possibility that this is a, you know, there's going to be investigations and, and let's say they do prove the fact that they didn't know that there's a breach. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Um, you know, if there's ever a breach at a company, these things get alerted right away. And the people who own these areas all the way up the chain are going to know, um, especially this size. Um, and then, you know, say a couple days after they sell their stock and then weeks later, they uh, let the public know. I mean, this, you know, this, this whole thing is just stinks. So, uh, you know, regardless of what the law says today, there, there's definitely going to be some kind of a uh, backlash of this from a, from a, from a uh, government loss perspective. Yeah. And, and I, I'd say, hey, uh, FTC, you may also want to look at any short trading that occurred with Equifax over the last month or so, because that's also kind of suspect. Uh, and, and, and to those executives, you may want to contact Martha Stewart, because I hear that she can redecorate a jail cell with just a couple of throw pillows and some moss. It'll be fantastic. OK, gentlemen, the last question before we have to move on to our guest is who owns the data? This this is the primary question that we're talking about anytime we look at a breach. Who owns that data? Because that determines whether or not there's financial harm. And in our system of law, that determines whether or not something becomes criminal. Lou, let's start with you. Equifax collects my data. It's my personally identifying information. It is, it is my identity. It is my fingerprint in the financial world. And yet, another company can collect it. They can share it. They can sell it. I am not compensated. And if they lose it, I don't really have any recourse. Is U.S. law not caught up to the digital age? It's not. I think of it, you know, you, I don't know if anybody's heard of the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation that's happening in the EU right now. Companies are freaking out about this thing because it, it requires you 
to as a, a company, if a, a customer comes along, and I'm simplifying this, by the way, customer comes along and says, I want to know what you have on me. You're required to produce it in a very small, small period of time. And if they say, I don't like what you have, delete it. You again, have only a small amount of time to get rid of it. And again, if you don't, you start getting fined and then you get fined and then you get regulated and then you get thrown out. So I think that, you know, these types of laws are needed, especially in the United States. Um, and, you know, who owns the data? That's my data, right? Uh, especially from the GDPR perspective. If that's, you know, especially if, if it has my social security information and all my transactions historically and, you know, personal information about my life that has to do with credit and debt uh, across the board, that's that's my data no matter what. That's why I'm sure that there's going to be some civil lawsuits that regard this going forward. Um, but, you know, there should there be more regulation and, and, and contraction against it? Absolutely. That's what the EU is saying is that we want this. No matter if it's financial data or not, I can come along and create a cloud service. doesn't matter how small of a company. And you need to follow these rules. Um, so if a customer comes along and says, I want my data out, you got to get it out. Um, and so I think going forward, there's going to be need to be a push from a, from a regulation perspective from the United States. Chibert, last word to you before we move on. Same question. Who owns the data? What's your, what's your personal take? <laughs> Well, right now, I think the companies think they own the data because like PC Guy 8088, they can have erroneous information in that data. And there have been horror stories of people battling with them to correct the errors. So I think the paradigm needs to change. The corporations all think it's their data. I again call BS. No, it's my data. It is your responsibility to hold it in trust. I think we need to go and treat it just like a trust and it needs a complete revamping. And I think what's going to require is we're going to have to have a class action suit to end all class action suits big enough that if Equifax try, you know, decides to um, not play ball, we need to bury them because this is unacceptable in this day and age. Rant off. Gentlemen, thank you for the rant. You know, I I knew that this was going to be a strong story. I just didn't realize how much ranting would come out. I think you know, we're really passionate when it comes to our information and a company acting very cavalierly about losing it. So this story ain't over, but we are going to move on. And thankfully, we're going to move on to my favorite part of the show. That's when we bring a guest in to talk and drop knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And in this particular case, we are bringing in Jay Batello. He is the Senior Director of Products at Savius. Jay, thank you very much for being part of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, thanks for having me. Now, Jay, for the folks who are playing along at home, what is, what is Savius? What is it that you do? Savius has been in the network performance management space uh, since its inception 27 years ago. And basically what that means is we develop software and hardware that uh, – analyze all of the traffic flow on a network and help network engineers find the problems uh, down to the very minute details, whether those details are uh, in the, at the protocol level or maybe even up at the application level, but all the way through there. Uh, that's, that's what we've been doing for, for 27 years now. Now, that's a lot of time to see this, this industry grow. And when you think back 27 years, almost three decades ago, the amount of information that you got from a data center or from a, a standard network, it, wasn't nearly as expansive as it is now. What what are the main trends that you've seen over the last few years, last few decades, that have made your field, let's say, more interesting? Uh, yeah, well, there's there's many, uh, but certainly it's been speed, right? I mean, when we started doing this, uh, it was even before I joined uh, Savius, but, uh, you know, 100 megabits per second is the type of stuff we used to analyze. Uh, now it's 10 gig, 40 gig, and we even get asked about 100 gig. Um, and you can just imagine those orders of magnitude, processors haven't kept up that way. So that's one huge challenge. Um, the second, and it's... Uh, but there's probably many, but the second, the one that comes to mind right now because it's top of mind is this transition to to cloud and public-private cloud. I know people have been talking about cloud for a while, but we're really finally starting to see that transition where um, major corporations, large enterprises, um, public sector are all talking about moving to at least some form of public-private cloud. And that completely changes the, the, the way and the type of data that these individuals, are, the network engineers for these enterprises, want to uh, analyze and, and manage this type of network data. They're not so much in charge of uh, all of the network anymore. They're 
in charge of the network connectivity from their users out through the internet to wherever the the, the cloud infrastructure is. But then beyond that, they're really they really lose a lot of control and a lot of a lot of capability and it's it's interesting to to see the change in the industry in terms of what data they would want to collect from the cloud uh, just from my own personal experience I, i've seen as you said the speeds have exploded i mean speeds that we never thought were possible have now become commonplace and, and also the the move to cloud and hybrid deployments have changed what I expect out of my monitoring tools. My monitoring tool used to sit in a, in a data closet somewhere, and it would tell me, is my link saturated? It would tell me, mm -hmm. is there a server up or down? It might give me a little bit of information about which clients were using which services, but that was pretty much it. It was, it was a simple affair, and if it could give me that, that was normally enough for me to do my job. Fast forward to modern day, and my monitoring suite not only needs to be able to tell me how my premise network is doing, it has to tell me what my cloud services are doing. It has to tell me, is there a problem that it foresees in 60 days? It has to give me compliance on upgrades and certifications for my software. My monitoring tool, I expect it now to give me in a single pane of glass absolutely everything that I need as an administrator. And of course, that's become impossible. I mean, that single pane of glass, it just doesn't work anymore. There's too much information on that single pane, right? It's absolutely true. It, there's too much information, and the 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 ability for somebody to to write the backend algorithms to to manage and monitor all of those different types of things. Like you you went from you know compliance you know all the way down to you know detailed connectivity you know type of information. Uh, I think it's really unrealistic to expect a single corporation, a single vendor is, is going to be there to, to deliver all of that. The single pane of glass is still nice, but it needs to take in pieces from many different vendors uh, to show that data because no one vendor is going to show all of that in, in a single pane of glass. Okay. And so how do I account for that? We've had a lot of solutions here on This Week in Enterprise Tech, monitoring solutions. Some of them have been designed to, to jump in, find a problem, and then jump out. Others have been constant monitoring. Others have been focused on security or uptime. If I'm looking at a suite, what are the things I need to keep in the back of my mind? What are the crucial bits of inf information that need to be filtered to me to that single pane? And then I per perhaps can drill down to find out more detailed information. Right. Uh, well, you know, we we do take you know certainly still more of a you know a network and application perspective on it. That's always been what our company does. Um, but actually, um, we had just focused on uh, some new software, and it actually does take a focus on four very specific metrics. Just to your point, because we really can't at these very high speeds. Back to the speeds, you know, we can't calculate everything about every flow on the network. There's just, it's happening way too fast. We have microseconds at best um, to spend on every flow to analyze anything. So some of those key metrics that, that we believe are the ones, and, and we're not the only ones, um, if, if folks that are out there, they can go search on golden, the four golden signals. Um, go, go, go Google that and you'll see there's a, a lot of chatter about that nowadays. And those four golden signals are around latency, um, uh, overall, overall quality, um, the, the network utilization, and saturation, and th those are really the four areas that we are focusing on. Because, as you were, as you were saying. The reliability of the underlying networking components, that's kind of gone by. We don't need that kind of information anymore. What we need is information about that user experience. And that's where the latency and the quality measurements really come into play. It's interesting. Uh, uh, the first interop I ever did, it was all about NetFlows. Oh, we, we've got tools that could show us all the NetFlows. That, and that's, that was nice. But as you mentioned, we've gone way past that. Uh, that's such a low-level layer now that I just assume that's taken care of. And you're right. I don't really care about bandwidth statistics. I'm looking at user experience because I could have all the bandwidth in the world, but if I've got my CFO who can't access data that he needs to access, I get fired. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that's, that's, that's essentially what monitoring has become. It's become the I don't get fired tool. In that, in that sense, what does Savius do that you think sets you apart? What, what are the particular pieces of the monitoring problem that you've identified and solved with your suite of tools that you think puts you head and shoulders above everybody else? Right. There, there are really, that, that's a good question. And there are really two aspects to that. One is um, at that high level, monitoring level, that, that ability to, um, to, 
to focus on the user experience, that's certainly one of those areas. And uh, we have a new software that we just we recently announced. It's called it's called Spotlight, and what it does is at true network speeds at you know 16, 18, 20 gigabits per second, we are able to not just analyze net flow, like I said, but analyze every flow on the network and and do stateful inspection there, meaning that we're able to, to compare information packet to packet because that's where some of that useful user experience information comes in. That's where you're going to define things like latency. That's where you're going to be able to measure things like VoIP quality because you've got to look at the spacing in between packets to do that kind of thing. So. So we're going from that high level uh, with Spotlight, where uh, we're able to monitor for the again those four golden signals for application latency, for network latency, for overall communication quality, and for UC quality, unified communications quality, and do that all in a single dashboard at 20 gigabits per second. But in addition, uh, you know. It, and what it's going to do is it's going to highlight the problems. It's going to show you out of a million flows, which flow is the worst one, which flow has the worst application latency. So you could be looking at your network wide open, and you could, within five seconds, figure out exactly which flow is the worst one on the network and, and which ones are the worst overall. Um, and from there, we also save all of that packet data. And the end user, a network engineer, if they do need to go in and troubleshoot that issue, if the issue is not obvious um, uh, based on, on the, the, the metadata they're able to see in the Spotlight dashboard, they can drill into that network packet data and do extremely detailed analysis to figure out exactly what is going on. Works well in the network space, and it works incredibly well in the security space as well. We just, you just went through a half hour right, talking about a, a breach at Equifax, um, you know, I don't know yet if they know how it happened, um, if they if they determined that up front. But certainly, if they had had packet data from that time, they would know exactly what happened. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think you're right. I think they're being vague because they uh, don't know. a they don't know, and b it was probably something really boneheaded, like they didn't apply a security patch to a front facing server. But right. you know, we've we passed that. Let, <laughs> let's let's talk about this because what I loved about this approach when I was reading up on it is. It's this is staged monitoring, and the first stage is intelligence, and that's that's what we expect from our monitoring tool. We want intelligence, but beyond that is actionable intelligence. And not just this is what's happening on your network; these are the security threats, but this is what you need to deal with right now. And that's what I like about Savvy's approach: collect everything, but only tell the administrator the things that he or she needs to deal with right now. Uh, we've got a couple of good questions from uh, from our audience. Uh, JJ to the 4884 wants to know, how would you stack Savius against, say, some open source tools? Because there are some great network monitoring, security monitoring, open source tools out there right now. Right. Where where would you put Savius in terms of that? Is it a complement? Is it a replacement? Is it a proprietary solution that stands alone? Uh, how, how do I pitch this to my CTO? Right. I, I do think... Um I, I don't. I don't see it necessarily as being complementary to what's out there, open source. I mean, I think in many cases it is a replacement, and, and not to say that any of the open source stuff is 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 bad because it's not. Um, but I don't think, or I can't think of anything that's open source that that is designed and and then does actually deliver uh, the kind of performance that we're talking about here. You know, open source projects are great for getting new functionality in there. Uh, it, it's, it's great for features. It's great for UI. Um, it's it's really very scalable, though. Uh, and, and that's what, what, at least certainly what we've seen as a company in our experience in the industry, you know, over all these decades. Um, scalability is, is really the key part. And, you know, with a single appliance, a single to you rackable appliance, uh, we're able to provide all of that capability that, that I described, right? That 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 front end monitoring where we tell you exactly what the problems are down to a specific flow, um, and then you know right into the detailed analysis. Um, I, I just don't think the open source stuff scales. Right, right, and that's that's always been my thing. I I love playing with the open source solutions. So you can get some amazing information by cobbling together a few of them into different appliances. But ultimately, what it comes down to is my time is more valuable than investing in an open source project. And if I can get from Savius in five minutes what it might take me 10 minutes to get from a collection of open source tools, 
that's worth a lot of money. Uh, no, that's true. And, yeah. and we wind up being the ones that are responsible, right? So right. When, when it's not working right for you, you don't have to spend the next two days trying to cobble together something new or figure out what's wrong. You just pick up the phone, you call tech support, and you say, hey, you told me it was going to do this. It doesn't do this. Fix it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, we do have a couple of slides that I, I, I would like for you to take us through before I bring in my co-host, just showing us a little bit about Savius's approach to monitoring and actionable intelligence. Can, can you run us through it? Sure, sure. So uh, th this this quote just kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? For for everything that's out there, um, you know, as it says, companies spend millions of dollars on entire rooms filled with beautiful monitors mounted on walls, desks and workstations built to look as futuristic as possible, low lights to just the right hue, comprehensive monitoring suites to keep track of it all. The trouble is it often makes people aware of a problem but offers nothing in the way of troubleshooting or the methodology actually fix the problem. And, and a I liked this quote because it came from it came from another company in the industry, another vendor, you know. So you know, somebody that that, that we run across, somebody that we know. So it, it made me feel better to know that you know, at least with some of the vendors, we can be honest about it. We can say, you know, we haven't up to now really been delivering everything a customer needs. That next one really, it really, I put this in here because it, it talks to the speed, right? You we were talking about the speeds and the fees and how things have grown, right? What this represents, and you probably think, well, what? What the heck does it represent? Uh, it represents um, about 200,000 people. Um, and you know, if we were to zoom on in on any one of them, you would see that. Um, and there were other slides that did that, but we, we took those out. But, um, but anyway, it represents 200,000 people. And, and I like this because I, I use this as an analogy to represent what it is we're able to do today. Um, you mentioned earlier the flow-based technologies. And flow-based technologies are, are really good in some ways. They're good at counting each one of these people as they come in through the door. But now they're out in a crowd. They're doing all kinds of things. Maybe they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, maybe things are going wrong. How do you monitor all of that when there's 200,000 people? And it, it draws an, ex an excellent analogy, I think, to, uh, to to network monitoring. And then the very the next slide um, shows what is often the case. This is the kind of data that people are able to do deliver, you know, on the base of people coming in the door, right? Is this useful information or not? It's a, you know, it was, we, all those people were at a concert. So we know the ages. We could see as they were coming in, they were, you know, were they wearing shorts? Were they wearing pants? You know, how many attendees were there? But does this tell me about any problems? Were there problems at the show? Um, was, was, you know, was somebody trying to climb on the stage? How many people climbed on the stage? You know, did any people need to get ejected? Did people get arrested? We don't know any of that now because we're not watching those flows on an ongoing basis. We, we don't, we can't see every transaction that happens on the network. So we share what we can show. And I think that's been the failure so far uh, with, with these dashboards. Um, so next, uh, the next slide. What, we, what we've done with what we do is we really allow for uh, some real user interaction. We're able to take in that, that network traffic very fast, keep it all um, in memory, in real time, and we can let the users answer questions, ask questions about the data and get answers. Um, I think the next, just go to the next slide. And it's one of the questions like, what's the worst VoIP quality of calls in a particular location in the Brussels office? The way we've, um, the way we're doing the analysis now, we're able to answer very specific questions like that within a few seconds. Um, the next slide is, yeah, any, is there any FTP traffic on the network? We just, again, talking on that security front, any network engineer should be skeptical of FTP traffic on their network. So, you know, with, with the, the Savius uh, Spotlight dashboard, you can just simple click in the UI and find out, is there any FTP traffic going on right now? I have a million flows. Are any doing FTP? Hopefully the answer is zero. And then things like, you know, what's the application latency in the New York accounting department uh, office? What are they experiencing? You can drill in that closely. So even though we're always looking at all of the data, we can make the, 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 the relevant data um, immediately exposed to the network engineer so they, so they can get to and, and analyze exactly the specific situation they're interested in analyzing. Um, the last just gives you an overall kind of screenshot of that. It's bar charts, and people might think, hey, that looks like other monitoring solutions I've had, I, I see. But the one thing that's unique about that is every one of those bars represents an individual transaction on the network. So you see that very large one in the upper left-hand corner, that one one transaction is exhibiting far more application latency than any other 
uh, flow or transaction on my network. So with the user, without doing anything so far, they automatically know that there's a that there's a big problem somewhere. And what the little dialogue in front of it shows is they know exactly where it is. They know who who it's between, what server, what client. They know it was over HTTPS. Uh, they can see the application latency was horrible, hundreds of seconds. The network latency was low. So now they know that that user is having an application problem. They can click that investigate button and go see the details, the, the very nitty gritty details of what's going on behind that flow. So that so uh, kind of takes you through fairly quickly um, the, the type of things that we've done with the Spotlight technology and how we're trying to turn, you know, what was the network performance uh, management uh, world maybe on its head a little bit. You know, I think the title of this originally was, you know, uh, NPM is so 2007. Um, and, and, uh, and that really kind of is. We want to take it past what people could do with NetFlow and SFlow in the past um, and, and show people exactly where the problems are within a few seconds. Fantastic. All right, Jay, I, I do want to bring my co-host back in here before we have to end. Uh, Lou, very interesting monitoring solution. I love the fact that it's going to go ahead and take the flows that I'm already using in my monitoring software and uh, and just give me more actionable intelligence. That's always a welcome sight. But you had a question about how this is going to work across hybrid developments, right? I mean, because that's that's basically par for the course now. Right. So I think my question would be is, you know, we have lots of corporations that come in and they they be, they start moving mission critical systems to the cloud and they need to understand the, you know, not only the internet traffic of whether things are leaking out of that type of integration, but also um, if there is um, you know, extra traffic that's kind of going to the wrong things that they haven't seen before trending in the wrong the wrong direction is this type of solution kind of supportive of that type of th type of environment and you know have you what kind of solutions in the past have you seen kind of people build on top of hybrids that that need to be monitored that way yeah, and it is certainly supportive of that. Um, in this first iteration of Spotlight, since we just uh, uh, delivered it, uh, actually within the last month or so, uh, it is appliance-based, and typically we expect our customers to install it at, you know, at, at their uh, basically at their internet connection. Uh, but uh, it, we're already working on um, a cloud-based or you know, you know virtual applications just that could be put into the cloud to do the same kind of monitoring. Um, the technology is also extremely well suited to automation um, because everything that we, of course, can control through the UI can easily be controlled um, programmatically with algorithms. So, uh, for example, as you were saying, if there were certain certain uh, clients or certain servers uh, that should only talk to certain subnets. Those are rules that could easily and quickly be built in uh, and, and, and turn the analysis in those particular directions. So it, it is extremely well suited uh, to doing that. Not there today, but, but that's exactly the direction the technology is heading. You know, good stuff. I, I love, you know, this is definitely a direction that we've gone. Padre and I worked on the Interop show together. And um, this was certainly a direction, larger networks and so forth are working on. But let's bring it back to our fictional 10,000 seat organization. How do we, you know, how much integration have you guys done? Is there some consulting involved um, during the install on how we place the appliances, how we place um, different tools? And for integration, are we going to have to do a forklift upgrade on our network? Um, do you only support top tier network equipment or can we start, you know, easing in and using some of the older stuff? Right. Um, so this this runs on, on our own appliance, but... Um, it is entirely independent of anything else on the network. Uh, all it requires is a feed of network packets. So um, assuming your switch or router, wherever that you want to tap the traffic from, is not already oversubscribed, you could do a span port, direct that packet, uh, direct that packet flow into our appliance and everything runs just as it is. The great thing about this industry is you know, the, the standards behind packets are rock solid. So, you know, there's no issue uh, taking a packet feed from anything. Uh, they are all going to have standard formatted packets in them. Um, so from that perspective, there's really no integration that, that needs to happen. It's really uh, 
mostly plug and play. Uh, the one other thing I would say is when we sell an appliance, we always sell it with uh, with a day of services. So somebody can go, you, you'll get one of our sales engineers to come in along with the appliance, help you decide the right place to put it, um, to get it going, give you some training on the UI. Um, Believe me, you know we have other products um, as well, and and the UI that we've de- developed behind Spotlight that I showed in the in the slide is far easier to use than than most user interfaces, certainly even than others that we have. So uh, it, it makes it very easy. Users get used to it very very fast. I've been on the phone with customers, and and they're able to deal with this and start using it very quickly, uh, and and really love the fact that it's telling them exactly where the problem areas are. Jay, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but I do want to give you a little bit of time here at the end of the show to to sort of drive home to our audience what it is that Savius can do for their deployments. If if you had an elevator pitch with any member of the Twiat Riot, what would be the the bits and pieces that you want to highlight that you want to emphasize about your solution? How how would you tell them that you can give them the intelligence that they need? Right. We, we really have, the, I think, the only solution that goes from, you know, high level monitoring, you know, down to the, the most detailed analysis you can possibly perform, that being right down at the packet level. So we can go from showing you at, at 20 gigabits per second and um, give you a monitoring view that shows you uh, not just some graphs, uh, not just some overall usability or some overall utilization, but can show you exactly what's wrong on the network down to individual conversations and then let you, uh, should you need to do that further detailed analysis, drill right down into the very packets that are behind that particular flow uh, that have been saved for you. They represent the flow as it happened, even though it happened in the past, uh, at that point, it represents the flow exactly as it happened, and a network engineer can can use uh, either our other tools of ours or open source tools to analyze those packets and determine exactly what has gone wrong in that particular flow. Uh, it's really it's the end to end solution. It's the ability to show you exactly what's wrong at 20 gigabits per, gigabits per second in five seconds, and allow you to troubleshoot it instantly. All right, I have to throw in one last question. We are out of time, but this has been asked by both JJ to the 4884 and Emily the Strange in our chat room. And they wanted to know what kind of information do you collect? If you're, as your clients are using know. your solution, <laughs> what do you collect? Is it sold to third parties? What is your policy on that data? Oh, yeah, no. The, so, first of all, um, our customers buy our appliances and they collect the data. So it's at the enterprise level. Um, we never see any of that data. Uh, it, it kind of has in the Equifax conversation, it's up to that enterprise. Um, and it's typically enterprise data centers that we sell this to and, and how they control their own data. Um, now, typically, even when that we collect packet data, so that's got everything about a network conversation in it. Um, and if things aren't encrypted and somebody was at work and shopping on Amazon, um, you know, maybe there's even credit card numbers in there uh, that would have been encrypted over HTTPS, but some of these uh, enterprises could probably decrypt that data. It's really up to them at that point. But the data only ever stays for a day or so. If people are collecting uh, data, uh, all the packet data on a network, it, it, you'll get about a day, and then it overwrites, and then it overwrites. So there's really no history that it retains, uh, but it does wind up being the responsibility of the end user as to how they protect that data. So your service, but their device, their data, their policy, and how they deal with it. That's how it should be. That's correct. <laughs> We have been speaking with Jay Botello. He is the Senior Director of Products at Savius. Jay, I want to thank you so very much for spending time here with the Twyat Riot. If you could please tell our audience at home where they can find out more information about Savius, where they can find you, where they can read up about the solutions that you offer for network monitoring. Right. Certainly. Obviously, www.savius.com. That's S-A-V-V-I-U-S, as you see on the screen. Uh, if you're interested specifically in the Spotlight technology, it's just slash Spotlight with that, S-P-O-T-L-I-G-H-D. And if you want to reach me, you can see right there, uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Jay Botello. Um, pretty easy to find me there. Um, you can send me either, a, either, either just tweet or send me a private message, and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thanks again for joining us, and hopefully we'll have you soon back here on This Week in Enterprise Tech. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Well, folks, you've done it again. You used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. 
That's according to 9 out of 10 NetFlows. I want to thank everyone who made this show possible, of course, to Lisa and Leo, and definitely to my co-hosts. These are the men without whom I could not do this show. They are the brain, the bronze, the beauty, pretty much the everything. Let's start with Brian Chi. Brian, uh, aside from trying to find yourself a cool place and maybe downing a nice mocha frappuccino, what are you going to be up to over the next week? Where can people find you? Where can people find your work? I am obviously on Twitter, A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, or you're welcome to drop me a line on email at chibert at twit.tv. And yes, JJ, yes, Emily, I'm going to try and talk to our friend Denise Howell. And that sounds like a really good topic for a crossover show. Mm. We've done it before, and we will do it again. It's like Battlestar Galactica. A uh, man who is not a Cylon is Mr. Lou Maresca. Lou, you're busy. You're crazy, crazy busy these days. But uh, people can still find you. They can still find your work. Where, where should they go? We well, always find me on Twitter at Lou MM, and of course, uh, check out uh, dev.office.com. That all my work that I do dev experience wise from the Office team you can find there. It's also the Office integration stuff, and of course, Ignite coming up at the end of the month here on the 24th. Of course, I'm doing a thing on the 24th pre day. It's called Ignite pre day. We get to do like a whole day kind of training session, going along with a bunch of scenarios, like hands on labs and fun things around Dev Office and Graph Office, uh, a graph type scenario. So check that out as well. Fantastic. And of course, thanks to you, to the people who keep coming back each and every single week to watch This Week in Enterprise Tech. Without you, we wouldn't have a show. We wouldn't be able to do this for all these years. We want to make it a little easier for you to get your quiet fix every week. Please, please just go to our show page at twit.tv slash quiet. There you will find all of our back episodes along with the show notes if you want to find the links to the stories that we've talked about. And more importantly, you'll find the place to subscribe. There's a little drop-down menu on the right-hand side to get an audio version, a video version, or a high-definition video version automatically delivered each week into your device of choice. It is the best way to support the show and the best way to share the show with others. If you like Twiet, if you want to keep seeing it, please, please subscribe and help us keep putting out quality content for all of the Twiet Riot. Also, don't forget that you can find me at Twitter, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you follow me, You'll see what I'm doing even when I'm not here at Twit. Like, for example, that time I was on an airplane and I got a tweet from Ryan Shrout saying he could see the back of my head. This was this was like five years ago. Kind of weird, but uh, of course, this is what happens because we're all one big happy family. Finally, thanks to, uh, well, the person who pushes my buttons, the person who makes this possible because he's actually a pretty good TD. He's developed over the years. Uh, yeah, Kevin, we got to talk to you. If you could open up your mic, this is the time of the show where we offer you a chance at redemption, where we quiz you about something that's happened. Now, what is it? What layer, what OSI layer is most responsible for the NetFlow information that we use for network monitoring? Um, the, the Equifax layer. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Oh. The answer was uh, Tele Dennett's. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not even going to try to fake that one. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for your uh, your help and for your button pushing. And again, thanks to you. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep toying.